Chapter 19, which is Book 2, Chapter 2 What We Saw from the Ruined House. After eating, we crept back to the scullery, and there I must have dozed again, for when presently I looked round, I was alone. The thudding vibration continued with wearisome persistence. I whispered for the curate several times, and at last felt my way to the door of the kitchen. It was still daylight, and I perceived him across the room, lying against a triangular hole that looked out upon the Martians. His shoulders were hunched, so that his head was hidden from me. I could hear a number of noises, almost like those in an engine shed, and the place rocked with a beating thud. Through the aperture in the wall, I could see the top of a tree, touched with gold and the warm blue of a tranquil evening sky. For a minute or so, I remained watching the curate, and then I advanced, crouching and stepping with extreme care amid the broken crockery that littered the floor. I touched the curate's leg, and he started so violently that a mass of plaster went sliding down outside and fell with a loud impact. I gripped his arm, fearing he might cry out, and for a long time we crouched motionless. Then I turned to see how much of our rampart remained. The detachment of the plaster had left a vertical slit open in the debris, and by raising myself cautiously across a beam, I was able to see out of this gap into what had been overnight a quiet suburban roadway. Vast indeed was the change that we beheld. The fifth cylinder must have fallen right into the midst of the house we had first visited. The building had vanished, completely smashed, pulverised, and dispersed by the blow. The cylinder lay now far beneath the original foundations, deep in a hole, already vastly larger than the pit I looked into at Woking. The earth around it had splashed under the tremendous impact. Splashed is the only word, and lay in heaped piles that hid the masses of the adjacent houses. It had behaved exactly like mud under the violent blow of a hammer, our house had collapsed backward. The front portion, even on the ground floor, had been destroyed completely. By a chance, the kitchen and scullery had escaped, and stood buried now under soil and ruins, closed in by tons of earth on every side, save towards the cylinder. Over that aspect, we hung now on the very edge of the great circular pit the Martians were engaged in making. The heavy beating sound was evidently just behind us, and ever and again a bright green vapour drove up like a veil across our peephole. The cylinder was already opened in the centre of the pit, and on the farther edge of the pit, amid the smashed and gravel-heaped shrubbery, one of the great fighting machines, deserted by its occupant, stood stiff and tall against the evening sky. At first I scarcely noticed the pit and the cylinder, although it has been convenient to describe them first on account of the extraordinary glittering mechanism I saw busy in the excavation, and on account of the strange creatures that were crawling slowly and painfully across the heaped mould near it. The mechanism it certainly was that held my attention first. It was one of those complicated fabrics that have since been called handling machines, and the study of which has already given such an enormous impetus to terrestrial invention. As it dawned upon me first, it presented a sort of metallic spider with five jointed, agile legs, and with an extraordinary number of jointed levers, bars, and reaching and clutching tentacles about its body. Most of its arms were retracted, but with three long tentacles, it was fishing out a number of rods, plates, and bars, which lined the covering and apparently strengthened the walls of the cylinder. These, as it extracted them, 
were lifted out and deposited upon a level surface of earth behind it. Its motion was so swift, complex and perfect that at first I did not see it as a machine, in spite of its metallic glitter. The fighting machines were coordinated and animated to an extraordinary pitch, but nothing to compare with this. People who have never seen these structures, and of only the ill-imagined efforts of artists or the imperfect descriptions of such eyewitnesses as myself to go upon, scarcely realise that living quality. I recall particularly the illustration of one of the first pamphlets to give a consecutive account of the war. The artist had evidently made a hasty study of one of the fighting machines, and there his knowledge ended. He presented them as tilted, stiff tripods, without either flexibility or subtlety, and with an altogether misleading monotony of effect. The pamphlet containing these renderings had a considerable vogue, and I mention them here simply to warn the reader against the impression they may have created. They were no more like the Martians I saw in action than a Dutch doll is to a human being. To my mind, the pamphlet would have been much better without them. At first, I say, the handling machine did not impress me as a machine, but as a crab-like creature with a glittering integument. The controlling Martian, whose delicate tentacles actuated its movements, seeming to be simply the equivalent of the crab's cerebral portion. But then I perceived the resemblance of its grey-brown, shiny, leathery integument to that of the other sprawling bodies beyond, and the true nature of this dexterous workman dawned upon me. With that realisation, my interest shifted to those other creatures, the real Martians. Already I had had a transient impression of these, and the first nausea no longer obscured my observation. Moreover, I was concealed and motionless, and under no urgency of action. There were, I now saw, the most unearthly creatures it is possible to conceive. They were huge round bodies, or rather heads, about four feet in diameter, each body having in front of it a face. This face had no nostrils. Indeed, the Martians do not seem to have had any sense of smell, but it had a pair of very large dark-coloured eyes, and just beneath this a kind of fleshy beak. In the back of this head or body, I scarcely know how to speak of it, was the single tight tympanic surface since known to be anatomically an ear, though it must have been almost useless in our dense air. In a group round the mouth were sixteen slender, almost whip-like tentacles, arranged in two bunches of eight each. These bunches have since been named, rather aptly, by that distinguished anatomist Professor Howes, the hands. Even as I saw these Martians for the first time, They seem to be endeavouring to raise themselves on these hands, but of course, with the increased weight of terrestrial conditions, this was impossible. There is reason to suppose that on Mars, they may have progressed upon them with some facility. The internal anatomy, I may remark here, as dissection has since shown, was almost equally simple. The greater part of the structure was the brain, sending enormous nerves to the eyes, ear, and tactile tentacles. Besides this were the bulky lungs, into which the mouth opened, and the heart and its vessels. The pulmonary distress caused by the denser atmosphere and greater gravitational attraction was only too evident in the convulsive movements of the outer skin. And this was the sum of the Martian organs. Strange as it may seem to a human being, all the complex apparatus of digestion, which makes up the bulk of our bodies, did not exist in the Martians. They were heads, merely heads. Entrails, they had none. They did not eat, much less digest. Instead, they took the fresh, living blood of other creatures, 
and injected it into their own veins. I have myself seen this being done, as I shall mention in its place, but, squeamish as I may seem, I cannot bring myself to describe what I could not endure even to continue watching. Let it suffice to say, blood obtained from a still living animal, in most cases from a human being, was run directly by means of a little pipette into the recipient canal. The bare idea of this is no doubt horribly repulsive to us, but at the same time I think that we should remember how repulsive our carnivorous habits would seem to an intelligent rabbit. The physiological advantages of the practice of injection are undeniable. If one thinks of the tremendous waste of human time and energy occasioned by eating and the digestive process, our bodies are made up of glands and tubes and organs, occupied in turning heterogeneous food into blood. The digestive processes and their reaction upon the nervous system sap our strength and colour our minds. Men go happy or miserable as they have healthy or unhealthy livers or sound gastric glands. But the Martians were lifted above all of these organic fluctuations of mood and emotion. Their undeniable preference for men as their source of nourishment is partly explained by the nature of the remains of the victims they had brought with them as provisions from Mars. These creatures, to judge from the shriveled remains that have fallen into human hands, were bipeds with flimsy, silicious skeletons, almost like those of the silicious sponges, and feeble musculature, standing about six feet high and having round, erect heads and large eyes in flinty sockets. Two or three of these seem to have been brought in each cylinder, and all were killed before Earth was reached. It was just as well for them, for the mere attempt to stand upright on our planet would have broken every bone in their bodies. And while I am engaged in this description, I may add in this place certain further details which, although they were not at all evident to us at the time, will enable the reader who is unacquainted with them to form a clearer picture of these offensive creatures. In three other points, their physiology differed strangely from ours. Their organisms did not sleep any more than the heart of man sleeps. Since they had no extensive muscular mechanism to recuperate, that periodical extinction was unknown to them. They had little or no sense of fatigue, it would seem. On Earth, they could never have moved without effort, yet even to the last, they kept in action. In 24 hours, they did 24 hours of work, as even on Earth is perhaps the case with the ants. In the next place, wonderful as it seems in a sexual world, the Martians were absolutely without sex and therefore without any of the tumultuous emotions that arise from that difference among men. A young Martian, there can now be no dispute, was really born upon Earth during the war, and it was found attached to its parent, partially budded off, just as young lily bulbs bud off, or like the young animals in the freshwater polyp. In man, in all the higher terrestrial animals, such a method of increase has disappeared. But even on this earth, it was certainly the primitive method. Among the lower animals, up even to those first cousins of the vertebrated animals, the tunicates, the two processes occur side by side, but finally the sexual method superseded its competitor altogether. On Mars, however, just the reverse has apparently been the case. It is worthy of remark that a certain speculative writer of quasi-scientific repute, writing long before the Martian invasion, did forecast for man a final structure not unlike the actual Martian condition. His prophecy, I remember, appeared in November or December 1893 in a long defunct publication, The Paul Mall Budget, and I recall a caricature of it in a pre-Martian periodical called Punch. He pointed out 
writing in a foolish, facetious tone, that the perfection of mechanical appliances must ultimately supersede limbs, the perfection of chemical devices, digestion, that such organs as hair, external nose, teeth, ears and chin were no longer essential parts of the human being, and that the tendency of natural selection would lie in the direction of their steady diminution through the coming ages. The brain alone remained a cardinal necessity. Only one other part of the body had a strong case for survival, and that was the hand, teacher of agent and the brain. While the rest of the body dwindled, the hands would grow larger. There is many a true word written in jest, and here in the Martians we have beyond dispute the actual accomplishment of such a suppression of the animal side of the organism by the intelligence. To me it is quite credible that the Martians may be descended from beings not unlike ourselves. By a gradual development of brain and hands, the latter giving rise to the two bunches of delicate tentacles at last, at the expense of the rest of the body. Without the body, the brain would, of course, become a mere selfish intelligence, without any of the emotional substratum of the human being. The last salient point in which these systems of these creatures differed from ours was in what one might have thought a very trivial particular. Microorganisms which cause so much disease and pain on Earth, have either never appeared upon Mars, or Martian sanitary science eliminated them ages ago. A hundred diseases, all the fevers and contagions of human life, consumption, cancers, tumours and other such morbidities, never entered the scheme of their life. And speaking of the differences between life on Mars and terrestrial life, I may allude here to the curious suggestions of the red weed. Apparently, the vegetable kingdom in Mars, instead of having green for a dominant colour, is of a vivid blood-red tint. At any rate, the seeds which the Martians intentionally or accidentally brought with them gave rise in all cases to red-coloured growths. Only that known popularly as the red weed, however, gained any footing in competition with terrestrial forms. The red creeper was quite a transitory growth, and few people have seen it growing. For a time, however, the red weed grew with astonishing vigour and luxuriance. It spread up the sides of the pit by the third or fourth day of our imprisonment, and its cactus-like branches formed a carmine fringe to the edges of our triangular window. And afterwards, I found it broadcast throughout the country, and especially wherever there was a stream of water. The Martians had what appears to have been an auditory organ, a single round drum at the back of the head body, and eyes with a visual range not very different from ours, except that, according to Phillips, blue and violet were as black to them. It is commonly supposed that they have communicated by sounds and tentacular gesticulations. This is asserted, for instance, in the able but hastily compiled pamphlet, written evidently by someone not an eyewitnesses of Martian actions, to which I have already alluded, and which, so far, has been the chief source of information concerning them. Now, no surviving human being saw so much of the Martians in action as I did. I take no credit to myself for an accident, but the fact is so. And I assert that I watched them closely time after time, and that I have seen four, five, and once six of them sluggishly performing the most elaborately complicated operations together without either sound or gesture. Their peculiar hooting invariably preceded feeding. It had no modulation, and was, I believe, in no sense a signal, but merely the expiration of air preparatory to the suctional operation.
I have a certain claim to at least an elementary knowledge of psychology, and in this matter I am convinced, as firmly as I am convinced of anything, that the Martians interchange thoughts without any physical intermediation, and I have been convinced of this in spite of strong preconceptions. Before the Martian invasion, as an occasional reader here or there may remember, I had written with some little vehemence against the telepathic theory. The Martians wore no clothing. Their conceptions of ornament and decorum were necessarily different from ours, and not only were they evidently much less sensible of changes of temperature than we are, but changes of pressure do not seem to have affected their health at all seriously. Yet, though they wore no clothing, it was in other artificial additions to their bodily resources that their great superiority over man lay. We men with our bicycles and road skates, or lilienthal soaring machines, our guns and sticks and so forth, are just in the beginning of the evolution that the Martians have worked out. They have become practically mere brains, wearing different bodies according to their needs, just as men wear suits of clothes and take a bicycle in a hurry or an umbrella in the wet. And of their appliances, perhaps nothing is more wonderful to a man than the curious fact that what is the dominant feature of almost all human devices in mechanism is absent. The wheel is absent. Among all the things they brought to earth, there is no trace or suggestion of their use of wheels. One would have at least expected it in locomotion. And in this connection, it is curious to remark that even on this earth, nature has never hit upon the wheel, or has preferred other expedients to its development. And not only did the Martians either not know of, which is incredible, or abstain from the wheel, but in their apparatus singularly little use is made of a fixed pivot, or relatively fixed pivot, with circular motions thereabout confined to one plane. Almost all the joints of the machinery present a complicated system of sliding parts moving over small but beautifully curved friction bearings. And while upon this matter of detail it is remarkable that the long leverages of their machines are in most cases actuated by a sort of sham musculature of the discs in an elastic sheath. These discs become polarised and drawn closely and powerfully together when traversed by a current of electricity. In this way, the curious parallelism to animal motions, which was so striking and disturbing to the human beholder, was attained. Such quasi-muscles abounded in the crab-like handling machine, which, on my first peeping out of the slit, I watched unpacking the cylinder. It seemed infinitely more alive than the actual Martians lying beyond it in the sunset light, panting, stirring ineffectual tentacles, and moving feebly after their vast journey across space. While I was still watching their sluggish motions in the sunlight, and noting each strange detail of their form, the curate reminded me of his presence by pulling violently at my arm. I turned to a scowling face and silent, eloquent lips. He wanted the slit, which permitted only one of us to peep through, and so I had to forego watching them for a while while he enjoyed that privilege. When I looked again, the busy handling machine had already put together several of the pieces of apparatus it had taken out of the cylinder into a shape having an unmistakable likeness to its own. And down on the left, a busy little digging mechanism had come into view, emitting jets of green vapour and working its way around the pit, excavating and embanking in a methodical and discriminating manner. This it was which had caused the regular beating noise and the rhythmic shocks that had kept our ruinous refuge quivering. It piped and whistled as it worked. So far as I could see, the thing was without a directing Martian at all. Chapter 20, which is 
Book 2, Chapter 3, The Days of Imprisonment The arrival of a second fighting machine drove us from our peephole into the scullery, for we feared that from his elevation the Martian might see down upon us, behind our barrier. At a later date, we began to feel less in danger of their eyes. For, to an eye in the dazzle of the sunlight, outside our refuge must have been a blank blackness. But at first the slightest suggestion of approach drove us into the scullery, in heart-throbbing retreat. Yet terrible as was the danger we incurred, the attraction of peeping was for both of us irresistible, and I recall now with a sort of wonder that, in spite of the infinite danger in which we were between starvation and a still more terrible death, we could yet struggle bitterly for that horrible privilege of sight. We would race across the kitchen in a grotesque way between eagerness and the dread of making a noise and strike each other and thrust add kick within a few inches of exposure. The fact is that we had absolutely incompatible dispositions and habits of thought and action, and our danger and isolation only accentuated that incompatibility. At Halliford, I already come to hate the curate's trick of helpless exclamation, his stupid rigidity of mind. His endless muttering monologue vitiated every effort I made to think out a line of action, and drove me at times, thus pent up and intensified, almost to the verge of craziness. He was as lacking in restraint as a silly woman. He would weep for hours together, and I verily believe that to the very end this spoiled child of life thought his weak tears in some way efficacious. And I would sit in the darkness, unable to keep my mind off him, by reason of his importunities. He ate more than I did, and it was in vain I pointed out that our only chance of life was to stop in the house until the Martians had done with their pit, that in the long patience a time might presently come when we should need food. He ate and drank impulsively in heavy meals at long intervals. He slept little. As the days wore on, his utter carelessness of any consideration so intensified our distress and danger that I had, much as I loathed doing it, to resort to threats, and at last to blows. That brought him to reason for a time. But he was one of those weak creatures, void of pride, timorous, anemic, hateful souls, full of shifty cunning, who face neither God nor man, who face not even themselves. It is disagreeable for me to recall and write these things, but I set them down that my story may lack nothing. Those who have escaped the dark and terrible aspects of life will find my brutality, my flash of rage in our final tragedy, easy enough to blame, for they know what is wrong as well as any but not what is possible to tortured men. But those who have been under the shadow, who have gone down at last to elemental things, will have a wider charity. And while within we fought out our dark, dim contest of whispers, snatched food and drink, and gripping hands and blows, without, in the pitiless sunlight of that terrible June, was the strange wonder the unfamiliar routine of the Martians in the pit. Let me return to those first new experiences of mine. After a long time, I ventured back to the peephole, to find that the newcomers had been reinforced by the occupants of no fewer than three of the fighting machines. These last had brought with them certain fresh appliances that stood in an orderly manner about the cylinder. The second handling machine was now completed, and was busied in serving one of the novel contrivances the big machine had brought. This was a body resembling a milk can in its general form, above which oscillated a pear-shaped receptacle, and from which a stream of white powder flowed into a circular basin below.
The oscillatory motion was imparted to this by one tentacle of the handling machine. With two spatulate hands, the handling machine was digging out and flinging masses of clay into the pear-shaped receptacle above, while with another arm, it periodically opened a door and removed rusty and blackened clinkers from the middle part of the machine. Another steely tentacle directed the powder from the basin along a ribbed channel towards some receiver that was hidden from me by the mound of bluish dust. From this unseen receiver, a little thread of green smoke rose vertically into the quiet air. As I looked, the handling machine, with a faint and musical clinking, extended, telescopic fashion, a tentacle that had been a moment before a mere blunt projection, until its end was hidden behind the mound of clay. In another second, it had lifted a bar of white aluminium into sight, untarnished as yet, and shining dazzlingly, and deposited it in a growing stack of bars that stood by the side of the pit. Between sunset and starlight, this dexterous machine must have made more than a hundred such bars out of the crude clay, and the mound of bluish dust rose steadily until it topped the side of the pit. The contrast between the swift and complex movements of these contrivances and the inert, panting clumsiness of their masters was acute, and for days I had to tell myself repeatedly that these latter were indeed the living of the two things. The curate had possession of the slit when the first men were brought into the pit. I was sitting below, huddled up, listening with all my ears. He made a sudden movement backward, and I, fearful that we were observed, crouched in a spasm of terror. He came sliding down the rubbish and crept beside me in the darkness, inarticulate, gesticulating, and for a moment I shared his panic. His gesture suggested a resignation of the slit, and after a little while my curiosity gave me courage, and I rose up, stepped across him, and clambered up to it. At first I could see no reason for his frantic behaviour. The twilight had now come, and the stars were little and faint, but the pit was illuminated by the flickering green fire that came from the aluminium making. The whole picture was a flickering scheme of green gleams and shifting rusty black shadows, strangely trying to the eyes. Over and through it all went the bats, heeding it not at all. The sprawling Martians were no longer to be seen. The mound of blue-green powder had risen to cover them from sight, and a fighting machine, with its legs contracted, crumpled, and abbreviated, stood across the corner of the pit. And then, amid the clangour of the machinery, came a drifting suspicion of human voices, that I entertained at first, only to dismiss. I crouched, watching this fighting machine closely, satisfying myself now, for the first time, that the hood did indeed contain a Martian. As the green flames lifted, I could see the oily gleam of his integument and the brightness of his eyes. And suddenly I heard a yell and saw a long tentacle reaching over the shoulder of the machine to the little cage that hunched upon its back. Then something, something struggling violently, was lifted high against the sky, a black, vague enigma against the starlight, and as this black object came down again, I saw by the green brightness that it was a man. For an instant, he was clearly visible. He was a stout, ruddy, middle-aged man, well-dressed. Three days before, he must have been walking in the world, a man of considerable consequence. I could see his staring eyes, and the gleams of light on his studs and watch chain. He vanished behind the mound, and for a moment there was silence. And then began a shrieking, and a sustained and cheerful hooting from the Martians.
I slid down the rubbish, struggled to my feet, clapped my hands over my ears, and bolted into the scullery. The curate, who had been crouching silently with his arms over his head, looked up as I passed, cried out quite loudly at my desertion of him, and came running after me. That night, as we lurked in the scullery, balanced between our horror and the terrible fascination this peeping had, although I felt an urgent need of action, I tried in vain to conceive some plan of escape. But afterwards, during the second day, I was able to consider our possession with great clearness. The curate, I found, was quite incapable of discussion. This new and culminating atrocity had robbed him of all vestiges of reason and forethought. Practically, he had already sunk to the level of an animal. But as the saying goes, I gripped myself with both hands. It grew upon my mind, once I could face the facts, that terrible as our position was, there was as yet no justification for absolute despair. Our chief chance lay in the possibility of the Martians making the pit nothing more than a temporary encampment. Or even if they kept it permanently, they might not consider it necessary to guard it, and a chance of escape might be afforded us. I also weighed very carefully the possibility of our digging a way out in a direction away from the pit, but the chances of our emerging within sight of some sentinel fighting machine seemed at first too great. And I should have had to do all the digging myself. The curate would certainly have failed me. It was on the third day, if my memory serves me right, that I saw the lad killed. It was the only occasion on which I actually saw the Martians feed. After that experience, I avoided the hole in the wall for the better part of a day. I went into the scullery, removed the door, and spent some hours digging with my hatchet as silently as possible. But when I had made a hole about a couple of feet deep, the loose earth collapsed noisily, and I did not dare continue. I lost heart, and lay down on the scullery floor for a long time, having no spirit even to move. And after that I abandoned altogether the idea of escaping by excavation. It says much for the impression the Martians had made upon me that at first I entertained little or no hope of our escape being brought about by their overthrow through any human effort. But on the fourth or fifth night, I heard a sound like heavy guns. It was very late in the night, and the moon was shining brightly. The Martians had taken away the excavating machine, and, save for a fighting machine that stood in the remoter bank of the pit, and a handling machine that was buried out of my sight in a corner of the pit immediately beneath my peephole, the place was deserted by then. Except for the pale glow from the handling machine and the bars and patches of white moonlight, the pit was in darkness, and, except for the clinking of the handling machine, quite still. That night was a beautiful serenity. Save for one planet, the moon seemed to have the sky to herself. I heard a dog howling, and that familiar sound it was that made me listen. Then I heard, quite distinctly, a booming exactly like the sound of great guns. Six distinct reports I counted, and after a long interval, six again. And that was all.